This is part three in a series of videos about where elements come from. Today, we're going to start on what happens inside stars. Let's begin with the Big Bang. So we have the Big Bang, and it is uh, lots and lots of energy contained in a very small space. But the space is getting bigger, and the energy is spreading out. And eventually, we start to see uh, basic particles appearing. So protons and neutrons eventually appear. And then they start to combine. And eventually, we have hydrogen, helium, lithium. And that's about it. Um, and it's not for another billion years or so that we start to see first galaxies being formed. And in those galaxies, we have stars. And it's inside the stars that we can make heavier elements. So during the first part the, of the universe, it's very hot and dense, but then it's basically kind of cool and spread out, uh, but little pieces of it condense and come together and a cloud of gas collapses, converting gravitational, gravitational potential energy to heat. And eventually that cloud of gas gets hot enough to do nuclear synthesis. Nuclear synthesis is just making new nuclei. So this is making new elements. So what happens next? Well, let's start with the same process that's happening in the early universe where you have lots of protons, that's hydrogen. And so here I've got four protons and they come together and they make one helium and they give out energy in the process. That's the same thing that's happening in the early universe that we went through in a previous video. Inside real stars, you have also um, not just doing things where you have just hydrogen and helium, but later on, you've also got carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and other elements. So you can do other processes too. So I'm gonna talk about the CNO cycle. So as well as the proton-proton chain, this is another way to make helium from hydrogen. So here I've got a carbon-12 uh, nucleus, and here I've got a hydrogen nucleus or proton. And when they come together, they will combine and if you add another proton, you get a new element, that's nitrogen, and you release some energy. But the nitrogen 13 is not very stable, and so it actually decays by throwing out a positron, that's an anti-electron, that converts the proton that was just added into a neutron. So we're back to having carbon, but now it's carbon 13, it's got an extra neutron. Now we've got carbon 13, that's stable, we can add another proton, and that proton and is going to make it nitrogen-14. Nitrogen-14 is stable, so it doesn't decay to anything. But then we can add another proton to the nitrogen-14, and now we've got oxygen-15. And all of these uh, processes release energy in the form of gamma rays. The oxygen-15 is unstable, so it converts one of its protons to a neutron. So we're back to nitrogen, but now it's nitrogen-15. And then we can add another proton, and this time it will throw out a helium nucleus. So we start with carbon-12 and we end with carbon-12, but in the process we're taking four hydrogen nuclei and turning them into one helium. So it's doing the same thing as just sticking protons together, but it's using carbon as a way to change the cycle. Now um, let's have a look at that in motion. So here I've got a carbon, a proton comes along, it throws out a positron and it's got another proton positron. Now we've got another proton coming along and it throws out a positron. And now we've got another proton coming along and it's throwing out a positron. And now it's gonna decay and give us an alpha particle and a carbon. So we started with uh, carbon and we ended with carbon. We started with four protons and we ended up with a helium or alpha particle. Okay, so there are two basic ways that we can do this process of making helium from hydrogen. The proton-proton chain only needs hydrogen. It doesn't need anything else. The CNO cycle requires you to already have some carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. So the earliest stars wouldn't have had any of these um, nuclei or atoms to play with. So it would have been the proton-proton chains, but now we have the CNO cycle. And in fact, you're going to have different uh, processes depending on the type of star that you're looking at. So for stars like the sun, it's actually going to be doing mostly proton-proton chains, but it's going to have some CNO cycle process going on. At the same time, as you go to much more massive stars that have 
much higher temperatures in the core, now that proton-proton chain is less important, the CNO cycle is more important. So the CNO cycle is going to dominate when you have higher temperatures. Um, like I said, in the sun, the proton-proton chain is much more important. Now, we can understand this in terms of what's going on with the repulsion. So why are the temperatures higher? Well, remember, we have this equation that relates the temperature that you need to stick atoms together, to get them close enough that the strong force comes into play. And it's given by this equation where M is the mass of a proton, C is just a constant, K is the Boltzmann constant, H is the Planck constant, E is the charge on a proton. The only variables are these Zs. Z1 and Z2 are the atomic numbers for the atoms that we're talking about. So that's how many protons each one has. And so the temperature that we need is proportional not just to the size of the atoms, but the size of the atoms squared. And so if we've got something that's doing the PP chains where, so the proton-proton chains where we've got two hydrogens, well, they're just one and one. One squared is just one. So one times one is just one. If we've got helium, now we've got two and two. So you've got two squared is four, two squared is four. You've got 16. But if you're looking at the CNO cycle, now you're trying to add a hydrogen to a carbon. And a carbon has six protons. So it's Z squared is 36. Um, if you're adding just hydrogen, that's just one. So it's just 36. But if you're trying to then add your hydrogen, your proton to an oxygen, that has eight protons. And so its Z number is eight. And so uh, eight squared is 64. You're still only adding a one with the hydrogen. So it's 36 to 64. But that means that it has to get much, much hotter to do the CNO cycle. OK, so let's get into um, another issue that relates to how these processes happen and what the star gets out of it. So when we, we said that we're sticking hydrogens together and we're making helium, and in the process, it releases energy. And that energy is what is binding the pieces together. So let's start by talking about what a nucleon is. A nucleon is just a catch-all term for the particles in a nucleus. So you have um, a proton and a neutron. They are both nucleons. So the total number of nucleons is the protons plus the neutrons, which is often considered just the total mass of the, of the atom. So the binding energy per nucleon, so per individual proton or neutron, is going to be different in different atoms. So, But basically, the binding energy is how much energy is missing, into, how much mass is missing um, compared to the number of hydrogen atoms it would take to make it. So with the helium, we take four hydrogen atoms, and the mass of the helium is less than the mass of four hydrogens. And so that missing mass is what is considered to be the binding energy. You can think of it as being, that's the energy that was lost the, in, in putting it together. That's what's sent out into space. That's what becomes the energy source for stars. But that means you're going to have to give it back that much energy to break it apart. And so it is the binding energy. It is the amount of energy that's holding those protons and neutrons together. So just as an example, the binding energy per nucleon for oxygen 16 its mass is 16, it has eight protons and eight neutrons. So it's 16 times the mass of a proton, mass of a neutron is about the same. That would be how many hydrogens it took to put it together. This is the mass of an actual hydrogen 16. But then per nucleon, you have to divide by 16 because it has 16 nucleons, eight protons and eight neutrons. So this gives you what the binding energy per nucleon is. Now it turns out that when we look at um, the binding energy per, per nucleon, it's, it goes up as you increase the size of the atom. Um, it wiggles around a bit. So from hydrogen to helium, you gain a lot of uh, energy. There's a lot of energy per nuclear, nucleon lost. And then lithium's not quite so good, but you can see it's ge generally trending downwards until you get to iron. But once you get to iron, you no longer have positive binding energy. That is to say that you don't gain anything by adding more protons. If you add another proton, you'll also have to give it some energy to make the proton stick. Nuclear fusion is going to produce energy. It's from the, the mass that's lost from the uh, nucleus by sticking them together, works all the way up to iron. 
But if you've got something that's more massive than iron, it's got more nucleons than a regular iron 26, then it will have to lose, it will have to break up to gain energy. If you want to stick them together, you're gonna have to add more energy. So here we've got in the, for the low, um, the low mass elements, you stick them together and you do fusion. So hydrogen fusion is gonna give you energy out. If you are with large elements, when you break them apart, that is going to give you more energy. There will be more binding energy per nucleon in these uh, nuclei than in the bigger one. The higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the atom, okay? So it's gonna take more energy to break it apart again. And iron 56, 26 protons and 30 neutrons, um, that has the highest binding energy per nucleon of any element. For elements that are smaller with less nucleons than iron 56, they can stick together and become more stable. But elements larger than 56, uh, iron 56, are going to split to become more stable. So at the low end, you fuse together to get more stability and release energy. At the higher end, you split apart to produce energy and become more stable. And that's why the radioactive elements do fission. They fall apart to become more stable. What we've covered in this video has to do with mostly hydrogen fusion uh, and then how we gain energy from uh, different elements as they get bigger and bigger through fusion. When we talk about hydrogen fusion, that's what's going on inside most stars. Um, and what's happening is, I talked about the binding energy, we're using probably the most famous equation in all of science, uh, which is E equals mc squared. E is energy, m is mass, and c is the speed of light. And in this case, what this is telling you is that if you lose a certain amount of mass, then that tells you how much energy you gain from that loss of mass. So when I stick my four hydrogens together and I make a helium and I lose a little bit of mass, that mass is emitted as energy according to this equation. So as I said, that means what we're looking at is that the four hydrogen nuclei have more mass than the one helium nuclei. So some of the mass has gone off into energy. Um, like I say, this can be considered the binding energy. That's how much energy you'd have to give back to break it apart again. And just to give you an idea of, you know, you're not actually making very much with each uh, reaction. So four hydrogens to one helium doesn't make very much, but there's a lot of material in the sun. And it in fact is converting 600 billion kilograms of hydrogen to helium every second, just to maintain its brightness. So all the energy that we see coming out of the surface of the sun, its brightness comes from this reaction. Um, and it does that in order to remain stable. That is, as long as it's making energy, it stays hot inside and there is enough pressure in the gas from that temperature that it has that it balances gravity. So gravity is trying to pull everything in, the pressure is trying to push stuff out. They balance exactly as long as it continues to make energy through a fusion process. So for most of their lives, stars are really just shining by making helium from hydrogen. That's all they're doing. We're just taking the hydrogen that's the most common thing out there, and we're sticking them together to make helium. That means we still don't have any heavy elements. We made some helium in the Big Bang. We've made some helium inside some stars, but we haven't made anything else yet. So where does it come from? Well, that will be the topic of some future videos.